Hello, Kevin. Yes. How are you, my friend? This is Ken. Hey, Ken. How are you doing? Good, buddy. Really appreciate your taking time to talk with me. I'm a big fan of your work. Followed it all the way back to whole earth. And oh, whole earth. Oh, yeah, yeah man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and wired, of course, out of control, new rules, technium, with a lot of appreciation, great admiration. Thank you. Well, You're- my pleasure. Your insights are central and right at the crossroads of humanity, spirituality, technology, economics, evolution, and so on. Oh, dear. Well, um, I'm sorry, but I'm just trying my best to make sense of the world, So, <laughs> as, as, as you are as well. So, um, Indeed. Looking, I'm looking forward to our conversation. What I thought we might do is there's – as a you know a prolific producer of ideas, there's any number of ways we could do this thing, but I thought one of the simplest and maybe most fun for both of us would be for me to take some of your blog writings on the technium and read sections of that and then pause and then we can uh, discuss the central ideas and insights in each of those sections. okay how's that? We want you get try that for a start? Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's start with one on the cosmic origins of extropy, which I thought was absolutely absolutely fascinating. And it starts, technology is the visible extension of an archaic force which runs up in time while the universe runs down. Technology is the latest chapter in a continuous story that builds up order, structure, freedom, possibilities and good against the inescapable black drain of entropy. While the universe cools and dies, the spreading differential of life and technology warms up a greater portion of cosmic coldness. The rising flow, called extropy, enlivens our current technology on Earth, but was first birthed in the unlikely genesis of the universe 12 billion years ago. In that way, all machines trace their origins to the Big Bang. Technology is a cosmic force. That's a really kind of stunning view. (laughs) Yeah, I have to say that that's also a minority view. Yeah. Um, And not too many people are combining words cosmic and technology together in the same sentence. Right. So um, I am heartened that you appreciate the sensibility, but it – it ain't mainstream. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a, my own belief about technology is that it, it basically goes all the way up and all the way down. And seeing this view is in consonance with my own. Um, I realize we're both a little bit of mavericks on this side of the street. Your blog continues, as primeval matter swirled into galaxies, extropy rose as stuff gathered into life and finally unleashed its full power as self-consciousness, mindfulness. Extropy is now unfolding the technium, the autonomous planetary technological system created by our minds. It is this awakening sphere of technology which is so altering our planet, shaping our history, and disturbing the universe. So it really is that view puts technology really central to the universe and to being human, doesn't it? It does. Um, And later on, not in that post, but later on in my post, I also make the point that humanity itself is being self-defined by technology, that technology, that we aren't separate from it, that it's part and parcel of us. And so uh, our very humanity is being defined, but we are also part of a much larger story, that kind of a grand evolutionary story from the Big right. Bang, right. and that these things that we all find so not only interesting but vital, life, intelligence, mind, consciousness, and now technology are all examples of, of a larger class of things. Right. I would call extropic systems, and right. other people might have other names. And so, right. so, so, so we're part of a very big story going on that's expanding into the universe. And I think when we wrestle with questions about which technologies should we adopt, I think it's important that we maintain that longer-term view of where technology has come from and where it's going. Right. And that's not even to... Well, I mean, in addition to that, we can also go into issues about the meaning of our lives. And I think right. 
my suspicion is is that um, technology has a role in in the meaning of life, and that's what I'm interested in is is what is the meaning of technology. Right. right. And of course, we see that going back. You speak of technology helping to define what it is to be human itself, and this is something that is a recurrent theme in your work, and it's mm-hmm. a recurrent theme in, in important thinking. And we can see this, we go back to human epics of development or evolution itself, from foraging to horticultural to agrarian to industrial to informational. Mm-hmm. And at each of those epics, technology was, whether recognized or not, really central to how human beings define themselves. And part of how they define spirit, if they had such a conception, part of how they define their interactions, part of how they define their meaning Mm -hmm. on Earth. And so it's just now becoming the sort of central role of technology in doing all of that. It's just now becoming sort of self-conscious. It's not that just now technology is starting to do this stuff. It's that just now we're starting to recognize how it's always done this stuff. Exactly. Exactly. And, I mean... Yeah, one is we become conscious of technology sort of at the very moment when it's slightly becoming conscious of itself. Right. And that's that's the next big step. Right. Huxley said that in humans, evolution became conscious of itself. And that's sort of the first step to artifacts of humans becoming conscious, possibly, and then becoming conscious of themselves. And that's a whole topic we'll get into as we go on, which is the whole relation of technology to consciousness and whether consciousness can, in fact, be, you know, quote, downloaded uh, into artifacts, into right. technology. Right. Because you've got so many interesting points on that. Finishing this blog, you say everything we find interesting and good in the cosmos, living organisms, civilization, communities, intelligence, evolution itself, has a strong hand of entropy running through it. While the cosmic background slips away to its eternal rest, the energy coursing through these systems flings forward an unbroken sequence of ever unlikely existences. By the normal calculus of entropy, the appearance of both kangaroos and 747s should be impossible, and yet their unlikely existences and the surprising appearance of any extropic organization that stands upright in the stream of heat death serves as a platform for yet newer ways to continue the story of unlikely possibilities. Alfred North Whitehead said there was sort of one primordial fact to the universe, and that was, quote, its undeniable advance into creative novelty. Mm -hmm. So that speaks against entropy and for these extropic systems that you're talking about. Exactly. Our global technium is the current stage of the story. It is the mythic midpoint between a cascade of extropic organization reaching back to the genesis of the universe and forward to an unseen next. Here I'm certainly agreeing with you again that the technium technology goes all the way up and all the way down. If we follow the trajectory of this very long continuum, it suggests not only a future but a destiny as well. It is a course in which we humans will play a role, but we are still determining our exact role. At every stage in this long continuum, choices are expanded, and freedom to be is enlarged. That's also quite a stunning view. And very optimistic. (laughs) Very up. Yeah, it is. And to that extent, probably also a little bit outside of uh, mainstream. Yes. A little bit bit maverick shot, but I think it holds true. And I think we see it in human evolution as well, including present-day development. Developmental psychologists see human development occurring in stages or waves, and each stage is marked by an increase in freedom, an increase in the number of degrees, the number of perspectives that a human being can take. So it goes from being able to take just a first-person perspective and being very narcissistic to being able to take a second-person perspective and being ethnocentric Mm -hmm. to being able to take a third-person perspective and be world-centric. And each of those stages is an increase in freedom, an increase in consciousness, an increase in care, increase in capacity for love. Right. So so what I'm kind of focusing on is, is there a fourth-person perspective? Yes, and I think that's where we're sort of headed right now. Yeah. And uh, um, 
what, what that means. I think that's exactly right, and it's a meta perspective towards all the perspectives that have come so far. Right. And so that's why we're doing just what we're doing now, which is sitting here and saying, what does this mean? And as you also point out in several of these blogs, probably one of the defining questions of the next century, so defining it's likely to become available on evening news, is what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. Because even reflecting on something like that, that was you know, taken as previously such a simple question as to hardly be worth asking, yeah. has, because of the increasing advances of the technium, started to change the very nature of, of humanity itself, what it means to be human, what the possibilities are. Right. Um, well, I mean, w w well, it hasn't started. I mean, it has all along. We've had, yeah. def redefining ourselves, and all that's happening is we're a little more conscious that we're now redefining ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And so it's sort of more self-conscious redefinition. And that, coincidentally, sort of happens at the moment when basically we're confronting other consciousness right and so it becomes very perplexing and becomes very trying to us because suddenly several things happen one is we realize oh my gosh we've always been redefining ourselves oh my gosh we're now conscious of redefining ourselves we have a new responsibility and then thirdly oh my gosh there's other consciousness involved right and so it's like what do we want to be yeah <laughs> uh you know i mean not only who are we but what do we want to be who we are and so all these things are sort of happening and that makes this time to be alive an incredibly amazing moment right. and and there aren't too many times in the history of a civilization when they when they go through this and so here we are yeah we're alive right now. I, I think that's exactly right and it's i mean if you look at even the essential basic chunk to technological eras that go from foraging to horticultural to agrarian to industrial to informational, that's only five major, major shifts in techno-economic modes. Right. And for us to be going through one of those right now is astonishing and, right, right. again, incredibly rare. And it does involve, as you perceptively pointed out, the emergence on an increasing scale of a fourth-person perspective, of a meta-perspective on all of these things that have come prior and that perspective is being driven especially by the technium especially by technological advances right. in science and, and so that's why the work you're doing and the roles that you've played is sort of you know right at the central nexus of all of these issues just, which is why it's such a fascinating trail of, of ideas that you leave behind you let's let us say and also this, this notion then that the last sentence in this blog, at every stage in this long continuum, choices are expanded and freedom to be is enlarged, is a particular reading or interpretation of evolution as well, and also then impacts on our definition or notions or ideas about God. And the next blog that I want to read from goes directly to that and is called The Evolutionary Mind of God. And I'd like to read a fair amount of this and then discuss as we go along because these are all, I think, just absolutely crucial issues and will increasingly come to be asked and discussed in the common culture and not just something for philosophers or, you know, professional elite thinkers to get into. And let me also kind of preface reading some of this by saying that, you know, in my own view, we have these three general perspectives or dimensions that are available to human beings. The first person, which is the person who is speaking, the uh, second person, which is the person who is being spoken to, and the third person, which is the person or thing being spoken about. And because of that, in the emergence of this fourth person perspective, we can look at anything through those three perspectives. And I think those three perspectives are all real, are all equally important, and none of them can be reduced to the others. And so we need to sort of keep that in mind as we approach any topic. And it's true, I think, for spirituality as well. There's a third-person approach to God, which sees 
God as a third person objective entity like the great web of life or the whole universe as a system or a substance, indeed very much like pantheism. And that is one of the main topics of this blog. There's also a second person approach to spirit. And that's sort of more common in theistic traditions. And that's to imagine that what if the actual creator, designer of this extraordinary system, this Gaia, this great web of life, this extraordinary universe, what if the creator of that was alive and sitting in the chair right in front of you? There was an actual second person embodiment or manifestation of spirit. And that second person would, of course, be described in you or thou terms and spirituality would be a case of I thou relationship then and then there's also a possibility of first person relationship to spirituality and this would define God or spirit in first person terms in other words I or I amness or I am that I am or the supreme identity the Sufis call it or Buddha nature Buddha mind and actually sees spirit as the pure consciousness or pure awareness, the I that is aware of everything that's arising, and everything that's arising is but a manifestation of this one mind. And so there are all the three of these perspectives that can be taken on any event, and I think also can be taken on spirituality. So one of the things we're doing here in this blog is discussing some of the objective aspects of spirituality and discussing it in third person terms, it terms. And so I sort of with that prologue, I mean, does that make sense, just kind of a general... Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I, I think the thing about third, second, first, and even fourth perspectives yeah. is, is that while we talk about it, we have to sort of talk about it in one person, but it's very possible and likely that all three perspectives are true. Right. And so it's, you can put on your set of glasses, and so we can talk about, you know, the spiritual from the first person while the second, third, and fourth are also true. And right. So what's interesting about if we take the extension of kind of this evolutionary extropic sense of the unfolding universe as a, you know, as a divine act, then the interesting question, which I, your intro is sort of hinting at, is what would happen if you took that in a first-person view? Right. And well, I think that's one of the things that I'm trying to explore and that we're doing sort of inadvertently, is to say, I am technology. Right. In other words, if this is a divine force, then, then I am technology. I, I am part of this thrust. And in that sense, you can say, well, you're demeaning yourself because you're thinking of yourself as a machine. And I'm saying, no, I'm elevating myself, right. <laughs> I'm myself as a machine. And that basically it's, it's you know, it's kind of enlarging the circle of empathy because I'm saying the difference between me and the machine is not as much as as, as we think. We, you know, we have a little bit of kind of um, parochial thinking right at this moment because machines are kind of very still very primitive, but eventually we won't. Right. And I think that if we make that switch and to say, you know, I am the stream, I am, I am this extropic force right. unfolding, I think that does, again, that does, several things in reorienting our view of what technology means in the world. And, uh, you know, if, if thinking of technology as something that is a pulse of goodness in the universe is certainly not mainstream, thinking of ourselves right. as that is even further away, and we have a long way to go before anyone before there's a, a church larger than one here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it does make it if we look at technology as being among other things artifacts that are objective and are created by any sentient being so the technium uh, artifact includes a bird's nest an anthill yeah. Um, any uh, you know coral reef, any things yeah. created by sentient beings that are third person objects. Right, but I don't. I, I want to say that that yeah, yeah, that's the beginning. But also, I want to make sure that that we all understand that that technology is not just artifacts, Understood. objects. That they're methods and intangibles. It's that it's actually technology is a type of structured change. It's a method of learning. It's a type of thinking in the broadest 
sense of the word. Right. And and so we tend to to identify them as as objective objects, and they are objective, but they're not always objects. Exactly. And there's a in a sense a quote ontology, a realness to technology, whether it appears in first, second, or third person right. perspective. But it also then, in terms of third-person perspective, in, in just even a traditional Christian view that would see the world as the body of Christ, or mm-hmm. then technology can indeed be viewed as part of the body of spirit and yeah. a particular communication, a particular systems right. interaction, a particular component of spirit itself. Right, yeah. So, 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 so if you kind of, you know, crudely reduce that saying, well, technology is the body of God. Right. You, you wouldn't be too far off, but man, you're, you, you, you know, th- th- this is not commonly yeah, understood because exactly. most people say, well, technology is the body of the devil. Exactly. So uh, <laughs> I think, you know, I, I think which we we haven't talked about, which is the normal objections about, you know, where do the, the you know the evils of, of technology where do they fit into this little schema and right. um, you know that, that that's the common objection. However, you know that's in parallel to the to the just the general question of the, the role of evil in in the world. It, well, it, yes, and it does. Part of what we'll get into when we get into this blog is just that is discuss the ways we can talk about evil in this world. Right. And one of the things that a broad based pantheism has done as one of the three general approaches to thinking about spirit that you outline here. One of the things that pantheism has at least forced thinkers to consider is the possibility that both good and evil are somehow part of an all-embracing one. Right. And therefore things that had previously thought to be evil, in some case, like technology, are in fact expressions of a deeper good. Right. And that it's up to humanity to make those distinctions as to whether technology is used for good or for evil. And it's not something inherent in technology itself to be inherently evil or inherently bad or inherently alienating. And I think that's a big change in how the modern and postmodern world has been able to look at technology. Yeah, well, you know, uh, on this point, I, I would like to, to push that a little bit because I, I'm actually making a stronger statement. I think the common stance that technology is neutral, I think, is a little wrong. We wouldn't say, well, life is neutral. Right. We would say life is good. Right. We don't. We don't say mind is, you know, neutral. neutral. We, yeah. we, mind is good. I, yeah. I, I'm saying something a little bit stronger. I, I'm saying technology is good. I'm saying it's inherently right. Good. Got that, it. That, that the more technology we have, the better. And so, just as we say, the more life there is, the better. So, there, there are obviously there are aspects of natural biology and, and stuff that you know causes harm. Uh, you know, AIDS virus, right. whatever it is, that is present. And so, there are examples of harm, and there's examples of reduction of freedom and reduction of options in nature but we say life is good and i right. think the same thing so so i want to i wanted to to, Got it. to stress that this is not just neutral it's actually inherently good yeah and i think that is a statement that holds up across different perspectives so it it's it holds true not just for humans it holds true for the technium in general which goes all the way down which goes all the way back to the big bang and the technium is simply one way of looking at one perspective one dimension of this totality of unfolding being right and that in itself is good right and i'm totally with you on that and and it's as true for um birds and building bird nests as humans uh, building computers right and it's a fundamental goodness about it that is part of the essential fundamental goodness of manifestation we could say right 